That's all right. Uh, the other thing is that, yes, if, if somebody has a cannula around their nose and you light a cigarette up, it will, um, it will, it can cause an explosion and it does cause an explosion and people have died as a result of that so no open flames around it um, uh, um, usually if you're not going to use them keep it yeah, shut off the the, the flow uh, some of them get weak some of them leak out um, But the big thing is don't put any type of tape around the stem. You can put it on the bottle itself, but not on the stem. And the stem is the you, the silver part at the end where you put the regular wrap. Uh, the other thing is always secure the bottle. Don't leave it standing up. That's the best way to, to have that uh, stem be broken off. And now you have a sh uh, like a rock, rocket propelled grenade. Um, the amount of pressure in those bottles, it could actually go through um go through cinder block walls so make sure you secure those bottles don't leave them standing up if you want to hear me scream other than the monsters leave a bottle up okay now continuous use of oxygen is going to cause the nasal passages to dry out and so uh, patients that are on prolonged nasal cannula or pro yeah, prolonged nasal cannula use, um, their, their, their nasal passages dry out. So what they do is they put a humidifier uh, onto the, the oxygen in outlet and um, they connect the, the tubing to that humidifier and it humidifies the, the O2 so it doesn't dry out the nasal passages. So um, in the ambulance, what we do is a lot of places have these um, and they're specific, uh, not necessarily to the ambulance, that, that this is what they also find in the hospital. We used to have canisters that we had to get uh, sterile water out of and put it in there and then secure it to the, the regulator here uh, on the ambulance. Um, but nowadays they're coming out with these. I think it's probably a little bit cheaper. Um, it's one time use only because you save yourself having to get the, the water and the, the container. Now the water and the container come together. So um, usually puncture this here or some of them even um, they come in and I'll show you at, uh, at the school on Monday. But they have something you can attach to it. But you puncture it here and then just put in the air and it humidifies it and sends it down the tube. So. Um, just remember, we don't want to give our patients too much oxygen. And we already know why the, the oxygen toxicity. Um, now, I'm, I'm kind of surprised, but I'm glad. I think you guys are, are doing pretty good as far as this aspect. But I remember the last class, that one of the biggest worries when it came to, to oxygen administration was, well, are we going to know how much oxygen to give them? And, and that was a big worry, and, and, and it was interesting to see the worry in their face because they were really worried about not knowing how much oxygen to give a patient. And here, here's my answer that I gave them. And, uh, and it's what I'm going to tell you guys. It's going to depend on the situation. You know, you're either going to give them, you know, unless it's respiratory, you're going to give them low flow oxygen. Uh, and you would need to get a, a pulse ox. If obviously if they're setting at 98, 99, 100% at room air, meaning just like we are right now without oxygen, that's room air. Uh, they don't need oxygen. So if it's trauma, and it's if it's maybe like a significant trauma where they could be bleeding, you know, and that could lead to shock, then yeah, we want to give them high flow too. We want to make sure the body has enough oxygen so it doesn't start to shut down. So that's pretty much the the way it goes on those, so just don't sweat it. Okay. okay, you guys remember how to put the the regular on the bottle? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
And you remember not to scare the shit out of the instructor? Yes. <laughs> yes. It's true. All right, so you remove it. And the one thing about this here is that it usually comes with an extra O-ring on here. Okay. Uh, you have the two pins right here, or the two holes for the pins that are going to go right in there. So you crack it open just to remove any debris from in there. Um, you know, except for EMT school, once you're done, nobody really does this because it is a horrible sound and it does scare the hell out of people. So um, we teach you to do it, but once we do it, or once we get out there, we don't do it anymore. See, there's the O-ring right in there. You put it in. Um, how tight are you going to tighten down the T-screw? Just hand tight. And tight, yeah, don't crank it down. You're gonna mess things up. All right, once it's secure in place and everything, you open it up, make sure you have no leaks. Open it up how much, and then what do you do? I do. Just leave it open. Nope, open it up all the way and back a quarter turn. Just like your BA bottles. Open it up all the way, back a quarter turn. All right, so you see here how it's in the green. That's 2,000 PSI means it's full. Here's three quarters, 1,500, half, 1,000. A quarter is at 500. Usually at 500 is when we switch them out. Uh, one of the reasons we usually switch them out at 500 is we don't want them to go completely dry because when they do, then they have to be hydrostatically tested again, and that costs more money. Okay. All right, so depending on the the delivery device, you're going to start setting your flow. Um, well, before you put it on the patient, you could attach it and then on a nasal cannula, what's your flow rate? What's the flow rate on a nasal cannula? Is it two? Isn't it like up to six? Usually it's two, yes, um, but it's between one and six liters. Um, now, how about for for non rebreather? Six and fifteen, I think. Six to fifteen, although the book will tell you like ten to fifteen. Some will tell you eight to fifteen. Simple mass, six to ten. It just depends. But usually, if you're, excuse me, usually if you're putting a non rebreather, you go about 12 to 15. There's been times where I've done 10, but most it's of the time. 12, 12 to 15? Yeah, usually 12 to 15. And I was taught 12 is as good as 15, so sometimes I'll put them at 12. But, you know, if, if you're needing to deliver a lot of oxygen, I go with a non rebreather, uh, 12 to 15 liters. You could use 15, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't want to fight too much with others, but it's um, 12 to 15. Again, I, I personally do 12, but you could do 15. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. So, again, you notice how they're, they're inflating the bag. Once the bag is fully inflated, then you put it on the face, bring the elastic over. Don't snap that elastic on the, patient's, the back of the patient's head. Okay. Now, if you need, for example, if you need to switch out the, the bottle or you switch out the oxygen source uh, with a non rebreather, make sure you're removing the mask away from their face because now, remember, it's, um, it's not a breather and there's no air coming in. So they could actually inhale some carbon dioxide. And for cardiac patients, that's not a good thing. Okay. So make sure you remove the mask from the face. Um, and then as far as terminating it, just, uh, again, remove the mask, the cannula off, and uh, go ahead and turn off the O2. Okay. Um, now, so when uh -huh. when you're, say you're on a portable tank and then you get to the hospital and you're going to yes. move over to the unit, you need to take the nasal uh -huh. cannula out of his nose before you do that? No, not with a cannula. That, that's not that big of a deal, honestly. Okay. 
All right, this here, this is a partial non-rebreather. Now, I'm going to get a little finicky here. Not that I, I am normally. Um, but a true non-rebreather, it has two... Um, you see this plastic right here? That's a that's a um, flapper valve, and so a true non rebreather is going to have it on both sides because when the patient inhales, those close off, and it prevents any ambient air from coming in, mixing in without oxygen. So that would be that that true non rebreather. This one because it has one flapper valve, it's a partial non rebreather. So you're, you're also breathing in via the venturi effect. You're breathing in some of the ambient air, reducing the percentage of oxygen that, that the patient is getting. Then a simple mask wouldn't have this reservoir bag and it wouldn't have the flapper valves. So for that one, you don't need to use 10, 12, 15 liters. Usually six to 10 is what they'll use a simple mask at. Um, and I don't know if I was telling you, but one thing that got me really livid on, on uh, Saturday, uh, I had a patient with uh, w with seizures, and come to find out, they had her on one liter via a simple mask. It's like, what the hell is one liter going to do for the seizure patient? Any wonder why she had four seizures with you yes or today? And same thing with my boss when when she transported her the day before. The girl had like eight seizures en route to the hospital. And that's because they kept playing with her oxygen. Um, they didn't keep her at one flow rate the entire time. And that does make a big difference. Um, so when we talk about seizures, we'll talk about it more. But just keep the, the oxygen flowing on seizure patients, okay? Trust me on this. All right. So the Kila, like we said, one is six. Um, I'm going to see how you guys do in putting a cannula. It's always fun to see students uh, have this end up at the back of the head. It's like, how the hell, how the hell did that happen? So, all right, we talked about simple, partial. Uh, the tracheostomy, there's a simple mask that I was telling you. It doesn't have the reservoir. It has no flapper valves. It's just a simple mask. Uh, there's a partial. It's missing both flapper valves. Some of them will have one of them, I've seen. Uh, I talked to you guys about the Venturi mask, how uh, th there's there's an opening on the on the mask, or not on the mask itself, although there is there, but down here too, that is going to re um, reduce the amount of oxygen the patient is breathing. So if they need like 41%, they'll get the one for 41%. So that, that size, the hole is so big to allow or yeah, the patient to breathe that 41%. Okay. So. All right. Any questions? No. No. No? Okay. <sighs> I'm just trying to suck myself out for this next section, this next chapter. All right. So th there's a couple things I want to do with this. Um, I'm going to show you uh, a, a YouTube video also on 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 patient assessments, about a 15 minute video, uh, and I'll do that after. But with patient assessment, what you have to learn, what you have to remember is we need to assess our patient. And every medical person does an assessment. Really, it's, it's the same foundation. Everybody does pretty much the same assessment. It just depends on what level you are about what you do in that assessment okay now the 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 cool thing about assessment and um when you guys start writing out and for the elite ladies in here um christina is going to reach out to you guys 
And she didn't mention Vanessa by name and saying, Vanessa never got back to me. And Vanessa never told me there was a change. Ooh, so Vanessa. She threw, she threw you under the bus, Vanessa. I will call her because I know she's been dealing with Daniel. He's the one doing yeah. all the um, scheduling. But uh -huh. I'll call her on Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So, ooh, you've been called out. Otherwise, we're going to send them to Sierra Blanca or, or Dominion, and Dominion needs people. Okay. Claudia's like, no. Claudia's like, we'll remind you, Vanessa. <laughs> I'll call her on Tuesday. No, yeah, I would go to Dominion. It's cool. <laughs> friends there. <laughs> I don't know if I told you guys, I think I mentioned this to Claudia, but my dad, when, when he was being transported by Dominion, he's like, yeah, the people are nice. It's just they don't know how to drive because uh -huh. they were throwing him about. That's yeah, I, remember him telling, I, I remember him telling me that. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> they, they go a little fast. I remember the advice that, that my FTO gave me, and, and, it, and it's always stayed with me. And it's weird. I'm telling you guys, when you start driving an ambulance, when you start driving your personal cars after, you're going to kind of want to do some of the same things that you do. Like you always set the emergency brake on, and you always turn on your lights, your headlights. And so when you get in your own car, you find yourself doing that, at least at the beginning, until you can, you can kind of adjust. Hey, my voice is kind of coming back, I think. Um, but you, you keep you keep some of those habits, and the habits I hope you guys really keep are the ones about driving safely, like not drive like maniacs. But my FTO, yeah, my voice is coming back. Do you guys notice that? Yeah. yeah. It's the vape and the and the monsters. True. Although I've been, I don't know, actually, this is only my second and a half monster. Um, no, but I remember my FTL telling me that when you drive, think about driving a moving truck with a lot of breakables in there. So drive safe. So that's what you got to remember. Anyway, um, so going back to patient assessment. Oh, I'm so happy my voice is back. Um, I want you guys to develop your own assessment style. That's, that's the important thing. Um, actually that, that, that is a big thing. I, I really feel like the important thing that you need to do is not to be a robot. Okay. Just talk to your patient. And when I tell you this, when you guys are doing assessments, practicing assessments, please don't take offense to me calling you a robot. It's not meant to be derogatory. It's meant to get you to learn how to talk to people because that's really what we're doing is we're talking to people. We're trying to find out what's wrong so we can help them feel better. Okay. So just learn to talk to your patient. Now, the way that I teach patient assessment is a lot different. Um, number one, I sent you guys the PowerPoints for this uh for this section, um, the patient assessment, the scene size up, the secondary assessment type of thing. Um, but I also sent you a, a different type. It, and because I, I'm kind of, they tell us not to teach to the test, but I do. Uh, but it's, it's a way for you to remember patient assessment because there's already a lot of stuff going in going on in your head when, when you're assessing your patient. Now, as we start, as you guys start becoming more comfortable with assessment, then you can kind of deviate from it and develop your own assessment style. But right now, while you're learning it, I want you guys to learn the, the fundamentals of a patient assessment. Okay. I've already been telling you some of the things that, um, that I put in patient assessment, okay? Like the ABCs. So I want you guys 
to really take notes. I sent you the 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 outline, and I follow the outline. I did that outline out of memory because I've been teaching this a long time. I want you guys to take notes. Okay, please take notes. I want you guys to commit this to memory. Do flashcards. Do something. Okay. You have to put in the effort. So please, please, please do that. Okay. Now, this lecture, I kind of developed it working at a mountain community in San Diego. Uh, it was up in the mountains called uh, Julian. And Julian is known for their apples and their apple pies. So one of my students, he comes up to me one, one afternoon and says, Lou, you know what? I'm just not getting this. Can you help me out? Can you explain it again to me? So I was thinking and thinking and thinking. And... Um, I thought about being in Julian and I thought about apple pies. Now, like I said, usually when I do this lecture in class, I buy donuts and you know, everybody partakes in the donut and stuff. Um, I used to buy little pies or I used to buy pies and, and kind of give everybody slices and stuff, but that got expensive after a while. But um, uh, that was the analogy that I was using is we're going to eat a pie. And we're going to eat a pie in one sitting. Okay. Now, there's a couple sayings, and to kind of help you digest this literally and figuratively, is this How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. There you go. Good job. One bite at a time. And then the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. With the first step, with the first step, okay? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to eat this pie, but one bite at a time. And isn't it easier to eat a whole pie one slice at a time? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. And so we're going to cut that pie into four slices. And those four slices, we're going to give them names just for the hell of it. Okay, and those names are going to be the scene size up. They're going to be the patient, uh, the primary assessment. It's going to be the secondary assessment, and it's going to be the reassessment. Okay, so that's the name of the four slices, or those are the names of the four slices: the scene size up, the primary assessment, the secondary assessment, and the reassessment. Now, please, please, please remember the definitions that I'm giving you. In a way, kind of look at your book and pay attention to your book, but I'd rather you pay attention to me as far as the reasoning and the definitions of each one of those slices. Okay? Now, I tell people, and, and I seriously do, I get down on my knees and I beg my students, please, please, please pay attention to what I'm having, what I'm, what I'm telling you. Don't fight me on this. Okay, please don't fight me on this. I'm not trying to be egotistical. I'm not trying to be an asshole. I'm just telling you, don't fight me on this. Okay? So, with that said, are we ready to start that pie? Yes. 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 All right. Yes. So, let me show you a little something. Or mm -hmm. you're seeing a blank screen right now, right? Yes. That's because I blacked it out. Here's what patient assessment looks like. Right there. That's a, that's a, not a, yeah, that's an algorithm. You kind of do the size up and the initial, we used to call it initial assessment. It's the primary assessment. Then you get your secondary assessment and then your reassessment. That's a lot of stuff to remember and try to figure out how to do it, right? Well, guess what? No more. I'm going to explain it to you in a way you can digest it. Now, the other thing to do, too, you guys have your skills packets. So take out your skills packets and flip over. It, it's easier because I do it more off of the uh, patient assessment trauma. Take a look at that. Follow along. Okay. This is why I teach this to you guys. In my, my advanced students, I teach them this exact same thing, and I tell them, don't fight me on this. And what do, they, what do they do? They fight me on it. You know what happens at National Registry time? They fell it because they didn't listen to me. 
again, not trying to be a jerk, but I've been teaching this long enough and I've seen what works. Okay. Now, Dan Limmer, a colleague of mine, uh, I think I mentioned him to you guys. He, uh, he teaches a little bit different as far as the ABCs, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, <clears throat> I, I kind of get you guys to, to kind of understand the basics of it before you start adding other things to it. Okay. Hello. You, yes, ma'am. You're gonna talk. You're gonna talk about the patient assessment in trauma. Yes, ma'am. So now when you help me out last, was it last week? Uh, yeah. You're, you're going to see what, what I was talking about with, with the, well, with the assessment part of it. Okay. All right. So the very first slice, we call it the scene size up. What you have to remember about the scene size up is we do it in order to determine whether the scene is safe for us to get out of our vehicle, and then is it safe for us to approach our patient? In other words, before we even get out of our vehicle, is there anything there that can harm us? In other words, is there a big dog coming at us? Is there a guy with a gun? Is there a smoke cloud? Is there um, power lines down? Is there a tornado coming? You know, is there anything there that can harm us before we get out of our vehicle? Okay. Now, if it's safe for us to get out of our vehicle, now the next thing is, is it safe for us to approach our patient? Again, is there a dog there? Is there a bystander that looks mad? Um, is there anything there that can harm us? Okay. So that's what we have to do in order to determine whether it's safe for us to get out of our vehicle and is it safe to approach the patient. Okay. Now, the way we do that, and I, I kind of put this in because I learned it in basic trauma life support. And then I'm like, hey, this works. And if you look at your skills packet, you're going to see how it makes perfect sense. And so I want you guys to learn the acronym and also the definition, but the acronym of PENMAN, PPE, and, and I'll, 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 you'll see it in the slide in a moment. So PPE, environment, number of patients, mechanism of injury or nature of illness, additional resources, and then need for extrication slash C-spine, okay? That's how we determine scene size up, by utilizing the acronym PENMAN. And so, there's PENMAN. And we usually say BSI scene safety. Well, as far as BSI, yeah, it's good to have, especially right now. But if you need it right away, then you know what? Don't worry about it so much. What if the person is bleeding? Okay, yeah, it's good to maybe have your hands covered up. But remember the good news and bad news about bleeding? So we kind of don't want to get there, okay? So we want to make sure that we have our BSI on whenever possible. And then scene safety. Like I said, is there anything there that's going to harm us? I'll never forget the time I was at the station, and, and uh, we also monitored the, the agency next to us. They, they were a different dispatch system. They were the state fire agency. But I remember hearing on the radio the captain come on and saying, Monta Vista uh, Engine 81, uh, be advised, or whatever it was, 88 or 182 was one of the, the three. Uh, be advised, we have a guy with a gun coming at us. And I remember hearing the backup alarm, too, while the captain is saying all that stuff. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I hope that never happens to me. But that's a great example of scene size up. Uh, later on, I'll show you a video about a cop not taking good size up precautions. So... Uh, we have to make sure that the scene is safe for us, okay? Now, the environment. Oh, we already said that. The number of patients. We want to look to see how many patients there are because if there's more patients, guess what we're, what we're going to need? 
More units. More units, which falls under additional resources. But other resources you might consider is a helicopter or maybe a police department for traffic control, for taking care of the bad guy or girl. Um, maybe you need a power company. Maybe you need a gas company. Maybe you need uh, the rescue truck. What do you need? Do you need elites? Um, although it's going to take you a couple hours. Elites uh, and bus. 30 minutes. It takes 30 minutes. What about if you're an hour away? That's almost two hour hours you got to wait for that damn thing. An hour and 30 minutes. <laughs> See, so I just shot your your statement to hell. <laughs> you know, maybe responding within 30 minutes, but arriving at scene, nope. Yeah. But anyway, so what resources do you need? Okay. Now, as far as mechanism of injury and nature of illness, the mechanism is trauma. What caused the trauma? The upset girlfriend that hit the boyfriend upside the head for forgetting Valentine's Day. Guys, even if she says she doesn't want anything for Valentine's Day, still spend money. <laughs> it's a trap. Trust me. It's a trap. So you don't want that baseball bat upside the head or up your butt. Um, and the nature of illness is what uh, a medical. So what might have caused that illness? Uh, we talked about additional resources and then need for extrication. Um, and that's what it is for, for BTLS. It's need for extrication. Do we have to get the patient out of somewhere where they might be trapped? But in your skills packet, and really the important thing is spinal precautions or C-spine. And it, it's as simple as just grabbing the head and keep it in neutral alignment. You don't have to put a collar on them or anything. It's just securing the head and making sure the head does not move. That's it. Later on, we'll worry about the collar and putting it on the backboard and everything. But right now, it's just securing that head. Okay? So, scene size up. What is the purpose of the scene size up? To know what environment you're walking into. No, that's not the definition I gave you guys. Is it safe? It's to in the, it's in the outline I gave, gave you guys. Is it safe to get out? Is it safe to get out of your vehicle and to be able to assess the? Uh, no. Is it safe to walk up to the patient? Is it safe for you to get out of your vehicle? And then is it safe for you to approach your patient? And what are we checking for? Notification or what was that? What was that? Notification. Okay, but back up. Does it say there's anything that's gonna harm us? No, we already we already determined. We're, no, we're trying to determine whether it's safe for us to get out of our vehicle and that is it safe for us to approach our patient, okay? Um, I need to do something real quick. But how are we going to do our scene size up? Through Penman? There you go. And Panaman stands for PPE environment and number of patients. Mechanism of injury, additional resources, a need for extrication. Slash spinal precautions. Slash C spine. That's the last one. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. PP environment, number of patients, mechanism of injury, or nature of illness, additional resources. Uh, additional resources and then need for extrication slash C spine. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna see if this. Oh, that's okay.
Sorry, I had to scratch my ear and I'm looking for a video. So I'm going to show you guys this video, why it's important to do your scene size up. All right. So I got to go back over here and I'm going to go here and I'm going to do this. Yes, yeah, see that okay? Now, what happens here is there's a report of a traffic accident and police and fire respond to it or police fire ems now the cop doesn't have all the information fire department does now what i want you to to do is look at the time stamp up in here you see my arrow 1438 49 that's the time stamp and it, it keeps progressing as the call goes okay uh, uh, i like this particular version of this video because it has a music and really kind of sets the somber mood um, now can some of you guys respond to an anhydrous ammonia leak maybe for those of you in the county sanelli uh clint um fabens yeah because there's agriculture out there okay mm -hmm. so we always get called to those or like gas leaks or water leaks or everything. Yep. Now, one thing that you're, uh, they'll talk about also is that um, he has a voice activated mic. So whenever he's talking, the, the thing comes out or whenever there's noise. So again, look at this time set. Remember, five minutes from 1439. Okay, look at the time. You heard him getting out of his vehicle, right? And now from the time you see him come on screen, it's going to be in about two seconds. Okay, 144012. Ten seconds. Within twenty seconds, he's on the ground. Is he talking anymore? Coughing? Nope. Within thirty seconds, this is what happened to him. Now you hear how it's going out? He's not breathing. Breathing. Not breathing. What happened to five minutes? It wasn't even five minutes. No, so far it's been about two, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Breath. No breath. Breath, no breath, no breath, no breath. Notice how his respirations are becoming more and more shallow? I can't hear anything. I can't hear anything. I can't hear anything. Yeah, I don't hear anything either. Damn you.
Could have reminded me to put, include the system audio. <laughs> Back it up a little, little bit. So the fire department actually paid it. Now, can you hear it? Yes. Yes. You hear him cutting out? I think you should play it when play he gets out of the car. He gets out of the car. Here's respiration. Can you sell One more. Wait. Anything else? Any other breaths? That was his last breath. How long did that take? A little over two minutes? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, the importance of scene safety. Okay. He went in there because our first instinct is to help those in need. But what you have to remember when we're talking about safety, our safety comes first. And we talked about this in chapter two, right? Don't we have loved ones that, uh, that we want to go back home to? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so our safety comes first. Then it's our partner safety. Then it's the patients and finally the bystanders. Um, I'm trying to remember if I told you guys this. I, I believe, and I, I don't want to sound pompous, but I believe that what we do is a very humble thing, a very honorable thing. However, there's a time that we need to be selfish. And when it comes to our safety, that's when we need to be selfish. Okay because others are not going to care about it. Again, our instinct is going in and help, but we have to be safe about it. Okay, we don't want to end up like him. So, a couple things on here. So, I, I don't want you guys to, to kind of go off too much on things. We're not going to assume anything. We're just going off of the picture that we're seeing right now. And so what we're seeing right now is this you are right now it's just you we don't see any other ems provider you're her right here okay is this scene safe for you to enter yes no. why do you say yes i say no oh well, somebody said yes why do you say yes i said yes okay why because there's nothing in the way. Okay, well, when you're you're talking about entering a scene, you want to look at the big picture. Okay, always look at the big picture. Um, it appears to be safe. Yeah, I, I will definitely give you that. It appears to be safe. However, looking at the big picture. I can tell you from experience, and some of you guys can vouch for this, that people are nosy. Oh, yeah. Right? I'll never forget the time. At, I'm at the Wall Island Park. I responded to a call there. And there's a guy that had a seizure or something. And here comes this old man. And he walks right up to the patient. And he's looking at him up and down, right? And at first I'm thinking, oh, maybe that's his dad or his father-in-law or something. And so I go up to him. I'm like, sir, can I help you? And he's like, nope, I'm just looking. I mean, he got right up into the dude's grill. And I'm thinking to myself, what the fuck? I'm like, sir, you need to leave. 
So he left. It's like, really? You know, it, it just it just blew me away. So uh, people are nosy. And as you're looking at this scene, do you see you see kind of nosy people, but isn't there something missing as far as the nosiness factor? Look at the Grizz Grizzly Adams looking dude. You guys seen the Grizzly Adams looking dude? The dude with the beard? Yeah. Okay. Does he have that I don't give a fuck attitude and that motherfucker got what he deserved? Look. Looks like it. And then the other dude, the 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 Florida retiree looking dude. <laughs> He's just like eh. Yeah. Doesn't that make you wonder why they're like that? Yeah. Okay. What about this here? Or do you guys see anything else that would maybe make you consider maybe not getting too close yet? Well, the way I see it, she's a female. I mean, like, I'm not saying nothing bad about it, but there's... It appears to be like a bar. Yeah. He's going all alone. Yeah. Um, probably people in pockets in there. Okay. So why was she going there by herself? Yeah. If you don't do it like when you go out, why would she do it next to help our patient? Like for that, I would wait. I would ask the dispatch to call SO. Yeah. Yep. So really, just the fact that she's alone. Well, she wouldn't be. Well, I can't say that because uh, some of the volunteer agencies, the county agencies, uh, they might have one person responding by themselves until help arrives. So yep. that is a possibility. But do you see anything there that would worry you about your safety? I honestly don't. Well, when you assist a patient, wouldn't you be giving them their, your back to the people that are there? Yeah. So then, isn't that like <laughs> Yeah, but what, what, the, there's a lot of things here. You, you're right. You got, you're, you're probably in a bar, although there's too much light for, for it, but it, it looks like a bar setting. You have the high chairs. Um, you got mean looking guys that look like they don't care. But there's something else in this scene that that kind of worries me that I can't, if I'm her, I can't completely see. Is it the pool table? Nope. The door? Nope. And his hand. What's up with his hand? He has it clenched and right next to his hip. Well, we don't know if it's clenched or not. What if he has a knife right there? He's waiting for somebody to come, maybe one of these guys to come over to him so he could either A, cold cock them, or B, stab them. Or shoot them. Who knows? Do we know for sure? No. Exactly. So we have to be very, very careful. So that's why you have to look at your scene. Make sure you know what's there. Make sure you're safe. Me, uh, uh I'm like Claudia said. I'm gonna wait for SO to get there. RPD. Okay. Um. But I have a question. Yes. So would you go back to your truck or just to wait for backup? Yes. Okay. All right, so you saw the the tanker, the hazmat. Um, try and identify the substance and know what distance it is. So, and you guys saw the video. Um, what about this situation? What about 
about Do you really it. want to get involved with this? No. 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 Now, if it's a single cop and he's starting to get his ass kicked, then maybe. But uh, I, I don't want the religious argument. I'm just talking scientifically. Are humans considered animals? Yes. 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 And what does an animal do when it's cornered? It attacks. It attacks. So do you think he feels cornered right now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So what do you think he wants to do? Attack. Yeah, attack, lash out. Now, the other thing about this one, too, any law enforcement people in here? Yes, two. Okay. You got him at a stance. What about her? Shouldn't she be, like, cover? Kind of a little bit out of sight? To not uh, ignite the situation? Yep. So that's just threatening even more to him. Okay. All right. Mechanism of injury. Looking at what caused the trauma, what do you think? As you look at the scene, as you're approaching it, what do you think? Fell off of the ladder. Okay. He could have fallen off the ladder. He's drunk at work. We're not going to assume anything, especially being drunk. What if he's diabetic and his sugar is low? Remember what I've said about assuming. Trip on the wires. He could have tripped on the on the uh, power cords. He could have tripped on the on the cement right here. Stuck a nail up his foot. What? Probably stepped on a wood with some nail up sticking out or something. Okay, but is there anything here that would indicate that? Maybe he twisted his ankle. He did a Joanna? Probably. Oh. <laughs> Where'd she go? Yeah. Joanna's not here? Yes. You're hiding from me. She didn't put makeup on. Leave her alone, Lou. Makeup on? That's... <laughs> I there you are. Safe. Uh, now, see, she has makeup on. Yeah, I went feet. I told you. So, we have to look at the things that might have caused the injury. Okay. All right. Um, something to remember with with trauma, uh, specifically vehicle accidents. When you when someone is in, involved in a car accident, we have to think about the kinematics of trauma. What caused the injury? Remember that energy travels in a straight line. And what what else do you remember from physical science back in junior high? Did you learn about energy? Is that the travels in the speed of Travels in a straight line, what else? Newton laws of motion. Okay, an object of motion stays in motion unless another acts, another, unless another force acts upon it. What else? Uh, potential and kinetic. Okay. What else? Energy can't be created nor destroyed, just transferred. There you go. Okay, so you're riding along, or the, the person riding along. Now, luxury cars, what I've noticed in my experience is for some reason the laws, the traffic laws don't apply to them. They do whatever the fuck they want. So as far as speed limits, yeah, they don't exist. So this guy in this Mercedes is doing whatever speed, 80 miles an hour down the down the freeway. And wouldn't you know, I, I hate it when it happens, freaking tree decides to jump right out in front of you, right? Yep. Now, we know that the vehicle was going at 80 miles an hour. So how fast were you going? 
80 miles an hour. Thank you. 80 miles an hour. So the object hitting that tree or, or another object, that's the first impact we have. And so now the energy is traveling. And the newer cars now, they have crumple zones built into them. Um, and as Santana said, remember, you can neither create nor destroy energy. You can only transfer it. So it's going in a straight line, and those crumple zones will absorb that energy, that impact. So they'll collapse at, uh, around the, the victim. All right. So you're going at 80 miles an hour. How fast were your organs going? 80 miles, 80, 80, miles 80, miles 80 miles an hour, right? Well, now, all of a sudden, there you go. And this patient is unrestrained. So there goes the body at 80 miles an hour. Striking another object. That's the second collision. Your body hitting the object. Now, the third collision that occurs, again, your body was going 80, your organs were going 80, right? But your body came to a complete stop. Are your organs still going? Yes. 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 So that's the third collision, the organ into the body. Something that bad, especially not having a seatbelt, your organs shift. And if your heart is shifting, it could, it could shear off your aorta. How long do you have, do you think, before you're dead? Not very long. Five seconds. Yeah. You might have time to make a phone call and say hi and not have time to say bye. You get about two to three minutes. Okay. Um, the other thing that can occur here is Remember being a little kid blowing up, um, blowing blowing up a paper bag, and then going to scare your little sister. And you pop it. And then you pop it behind them, and they they scream and they jump. Or maybe that happened to you. They did it to you. Nobody wants to talk. All right. So, what inside your body is full of air? Lungs. lungs, your lungs, and you're compressing that lung. What do you think is going to happen to that that lung? It's going to puncture. Not puncture. It's going to pop. pop. Okay. Anybody know what we call that type of injury? It's called no. a paper bag injury. You just pop the lung, so you have a hole in your lung that's leaking out air, which can cause a pneumothorax. What did you say it was called? I'm sorry? Paper bag injury. That's why I, I gave you the analogy of a paper bag filling it up with air. It's a paper bag injury. All right, looking at this one, what do you think? Alcohol. Just kidding. I'm going to smack you, Jose. No, it's because I saw the cup there, and I was looking to, to see if there was anything in it. What, just because she's a middle-aged white woman, she drinks? Oh, God, here <laughs> we go. <laughs> a middle-aged, middle-class, Caucasian female, she drinks? Uh, depression, maybe. <laughs> Isn't it a stroke? So for all you alcoholics that drink beer every single night. What's that on top of her top left? You tell me. I don't know what I'm trying to look at. I'm, I'm sort of uh, blind. Like a life alert, no? Nope. Looks like it. Is it a life show? alert, it's a big base uh, near a telephone or somewhere. And then they'll have a medallion that has a button on it that they can press. But no, that's oh, not okay. life alert. Um, that's a control head for an electric blanket. That's what I thought it was. Oh. Yeah, you guys are too young to know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Could that glass also hold water? Yes. You know, it, it's a good thing I took psychology in college because that tells me what 
what you guys are thinking and doing. It's like when you look at, I remember learning, when you look at a picture, the first thought that comes to your mind is what's going on in your head. So right away, somebody, Jose, went to alcohol, so he's thinking about alcohol. <laughs> no, not even. It's because I no, saw the No, don't. You don't. No. I'm a college-educated man. You, you don't have to lie. I already know the truth. It does have a ring on her finger. She's probably stressed. So it is probably vodka. Oh, you're thinking about marriage. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the wrong hand, guys. Unless she's a nun. You guys have to look at trauma or medical. Does she appear to be sick? The no. flu, a cold. She has a box of tissues right next to her bed. She's under a heated blanket. She has a glass of water. Yeah, she's pro she probably has, yeah, a cold or, a f or the flu. Uh-huh. Mm. So looking at the signs, there doesn't appear to be any trauma, although we'll, we'll talk about it later, but we got to rule it out, okay? So, all right. So what's the very, uh, what's the first slice of pie called? Fenman. Same size same up. Size up. The same size up. Sorry, All right, me. and what's the purpose of the scene size up? To know if it's safe to get out of the vehicle and is it safe to approach the patient? Okay, is it safe to get out of the vehicle? Is it safe to approach the patient? And then how do we determine the scene size up? Penman. Penman. Which stands for? PPE, environment, number of patients. Mechanism of injury or nature of illness, additional resources, Need for extraction slash extrication. I'm sorry, extrication slash C spine. All right, good. So that's your first slice. How was it? Was it yummy? Filling. That yeah, was pretty good. Anybody put ice cream on their pie? Yes. Or whipped cream? Oh, uh, strawberries. That's why I stopped getting pies for the classes. All right. Um. So I have 8.05, be back at 8.20. Just make it a real quick, well, I'd rather be 10 minutes, but be back at 8.20. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. okay.